<laughs> so that, so why is faith so hard? Uh, I it, I think there is because perception. it's supposed to be. Because oh, it's supposed to be okay. Yeah. That's the that's the deep answer. Is like faith isn't real until you pay a cost for it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Midnight Mormons. I'm your host, Cardinalis, and today I'm joined in the studio by Kwaku L and Brad Whitbeck. We also are joined by none other than Nathaniel Givens, author of the super cool book, Into the Headwinds. Just got done reading it. It's super, I, this is, I love it. And we only actually do interviews here, Nathaniel with people whose books we read. We don't do that whole promo thing of like, you know, hey, some guy's got a book and you know, we're gonna do him a favor and get him on. We actually read this, so. Um, At least two of us did. Uh, Kwaku. <laughs> who would say it would Kwaku. be Kwaku who would have forgotten? I read it, what are you talking about? Oh, you didn't, Brad? <laughs> are you kidding me? I, I finished it just before no, we started. I literally, okay. I love, so the part especially, uh, where, so I just talked up about how we did all of our due diligence and you crapped on my first point already. No, <laughs> it's great. The part where uh, uh, they walk into the wardrobe and see Mr. Tumnus uh, <laughs> trying to convince them that the white witch is going to bring. <laughs> oh, my gosh, man. Quaku, <laughs> you're, you're like the little brother we have to bring along in some of these freaking episodes, man. You know what I'm saying? OK, well, look, me and Brad. The erudite scholars and the responsible adults of the crew are the ones that are uh, okay. But to be fair, <laughs> to be fair, we I I was on a tour. I couldn't. I didn't have. Yeah. I had zero time. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you're off you guys have like homes right. with kids. It, it you can was, like put it, the kids to bed and read the. I, I was chaperoning twenty people for the past okay. three weeks. It only gets worse. You're gonna find out when you have them yourself. So um, we're no, just but kidding. but I think Quaker's gonna have good questions to ask about. Yes, it anyway, it's so gonna we'll be, be great. Um, so um, I was just gonna say, into the headwinds. Why belief has always been hard and still is. I think this is totally germane and and is is perfectly timed for the world and the time that we live in. Nathaniel, tell us a little bit about the book, how it came to be. Give us the background. Give us the nitty gritty, the whole nine yards. Tell us about yourself. Feel free. If you want to talk about crimes you've committed, confess any sins that haven't been resolved with priesthood authority, you know, go, go, <laughs> oh as, go as far into detail as you want, bro. <laughs> well, all right, then. That's a, that's a segue right there. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this is a book I've been working on um, off and on, I'd say, for about 10 or 11 years. Um, I wasn't intentionally working towards this book. Uh, I just That's when I started blogging um, for Times and Seasons about religion. Um, and I've just always been really fascinated about faith um, and kind of like the big question that I have of myself personally that kind of motivated this book is trying to figure out whether or not I believe the things that I think I believe. Um, and that might sound a little bit strange, but it's one of the main topics that, you know, my father and I address in this book. Um, it, you know, you go into the field of cognitive science, um, you learn about cognitive biases, and you also learn about um, confabulation and other things like that, which is where somebody thinks that they have a rational basis for a belief and they think they hold a certain belief. But if you press them the right way, you can find out that they absolutely don't at all. Um, and if that's true of people in general, um, might it be true of me? Um, and, and to make this really concrete, I don't want to be on my deathbed and, and like for the first time realize that this whole time I didn't actually believe it was true. I don't, I don't want to die afraid. That's like one of my life goals. Right. And so I, I really want to know, do I believe the things that I think I believe or not? And so thinking through that, um, and reading a lot of the science about it, I mean, it's interesting, right? This is a book about religion. Um, and yet almost everybody that we cite in here is, is a scientist and most of them are, you know, publicly atheist and secular. Um, but we wanted to use all of the cutting edge science that we could find on how beliefs are formed and why beliefs are formed. Um, and kind of take that and put it in a religious context so that we could kind of help people understand, um, their own faith, um, and, and how to make it stronger, how to evaluate it. Um, and also really, uh, answer the question of why it seems like religion is getting harder, because there definitely is a perception, right, that in the 21st century, we've got the rise of the nuns, greater and greater population of people who, if you ask them, what religion do you affiliate with? They say nuns. So you call it the rise of the nuns. So what's going on here? Is, is faith actually getting harder? Although, um, so, 
Those Rise, are the kind of questions. Rise of the Nuns does sound like a pretty like cool, a sick like, movie action film. <laughs> yeah, like, like <laughs> you thought they were praying to the rosary, they were praying to the nine millimeter parabellum. You know what I'm saying? And like, you just get a bunch of old ladies with like they're going to up. break your habit. What? Yeah, <laughs> just make all these nuns that, that's fun. epic. So, uh, um, epic action filmmaker uh, Nathaniel Givens has written a script <laughs> about the rise of the nuns. About the rise of the nuns. And, no, um, but I. I I really actually do. I really like the way that you outline things in the book and the way that you talk about how um, we kind of think that the general reason behind this is secularism, but it's deeper than that. I think you guys do such a good job of really outlining what's happening here. Um, and, and I think you did such an interesting job of setting up everyone up with an understanding of the, the way that our brains work to help it all make sense. So, um, I don't know if if you want to go this direction, feel free. If, if you want to take it somewhere else, let me know. But I was thinking it'd be really cool to just get your um, kind of your breakdown of like the one of the core theories, I think, of the book is the discussion of like the elephant and the rider and the way that our brains function like that. Do you, do you think that'd be a good place to go or? Yeah, yeah, I can talk about that. Um, so the elephant and the writer, those are terms that come from Jonathan Haidt. Um, though he came up with those specific terms. But if you look at the social psychology research, you find that there's a bunch of other people who all come up with this idea that there's like two systems in the brain. Um, they And they all give them different names because they're academics and academics have to name something like everybody has to give it a different name. Mm-hmm. So like Daniel Kahneman calls it system one, system two, whatever. The idea is that the elephant is kind of your unconscious. It's it's the part of you um, that you have most in common with animals. Uh, it's like evolved uh, for status seeking, for survival. Um, and the elephant is kind of always on. And then the rider comes later and the rider is like your conscious self that's like on top of the elephant. Uh, that's why it's called the elephant and the rider is because the elephant's really hard to control and the rider thinks it's in control, but really isn't. Um, and so the idea here is that you think of yourself as just the writer. And when you think of yourself as just the writer, your life makes no sense because you try to start a diet. You can't keep the diet. You try to work out. You can't, you can't actually keep your goals. I'm saying that people are deluded. (laughs) So, so why is faith so hard? Uh, I, I think there is because it's supposed to be. Because it's supposed to be okay. Yeah. That's the that's the deep answer. Is like faith isn't real until you pay a cost for it, um, and up until that point, it's just an affectation. Okay, for those of us that don't have parents like yours and educations like yours, what's affectation for the troglodytes in our audience? Being most of the time, blown. especially <laughs> in, in modern like like contemporary times, I would say especially um, beliefs are like clothing. People wear them to like signal their status. And to, and to be part of an in-group. Um, people don't, and this is especially true of like theoretical beliefs. Practical beliefs, like, you know, if I drop a hammer, will it hurt? Like if it hits me, like everybody gets that right because when you get that stuff wrong, like nature teaches you a lesson really quick. There's so practical beliefs, consequence, yeah. Yeah, so practical beliefs people are pretty good on and like your opinion and the truth, they tend to be pretty close together. A lot of people say that about modern progressivism, that it's a luxury belief. Now that even modern- Yes, now I love that. Yeah, now that even like middle class people can afford to have escalades, how do you differentiate yourself as uh, a luxury belief person? So um, I, I I don't know how else to better describe it other than, yeah, like luxury beliefs, virtue signals, so on and so forth. So, OK, there is this insinuation online, especially uh, with the rise of atheism, which just got co-opted into progressivism and is atheism plus and all this other stuff. But there is this wild insinuation amongst our detractors nowadays online that you're stupid if you believe. Okay, I've often said that our show doesn't have an official slogan, but the first sentence that came to my mind if we were to make an official slogan or mission statement would be, you're not stupid if, if you believe. But that is the insinuation from academics or from anti-Mormons or from um, really just pop culture in general now. So um, I would pose the question to you. Do you feel that it's harder to believe now in the modern day? Uh, It seems like from the book you said it's actually always been hard. Um, Could you elaborate uh, whether you feel whether it's it's harder to have faith nowadays because science is so awesome or um, has it always been hard? Just just elaborate on that. Yeah, sure. It's it's always been hard, but it hasn't always been hard in the same way. So like Mm. one concept that's really important to keep in mind is that there's a difference between affiliation um, and conversion. 
um, affiliation just means like you go to church, you, you consider yourself a member of the group. Right. And there are a lot of reasons that people could affiliate. One could be true conversion. They're like, well, I believe this is the church of Christ, so I'm going to go. But another could be, and this is probably the most common, just habit. Like, you know, my parents were whatever religion, so I'm going to go to the same church because that's what I'm going to do. Um, but there are other reasons too, like self interest. So if you look back at the history of Christianity in a nutshell, like, so for the first couple of centuries, it was really, really hard to affiliate with the church because they might feed you to lions. Right. So when that's happening, the only people who choose to affiliate, not only, but close to, are going to be the true converts. Mm. So you Is have that a why small California number- Mormons are so much more converted and better than Utah Mormons because we <laughs> actually <laughs> pay a price for yeah. what we uh, have to do and live in the belly of the lion's den. Yeah, a little bit. There, there's um, some truth to that. California Mormons just got endorsed by Nathaniel Givens as a superior subset to. Uh, no, I'm just totally kidding. I'm just totally kidding. So keep going. Keep keep, uh, keep going. So I mean so. Joining the Christian church, huge cost at first. But then, you know, the emperor, uh, Constantine, is like, hey, I'm going to convert and it's going to be the official state religion. Okay, now why are you going to join the church? Maybe because you're truly converted. Maybe because now this is the official state religion and you want to get ahead in life. So the number of people who affiliate with Christianity goes up because it's in their self-interest. Fast forward like, you know, a thousand years and Christianity dominates, you know, pretty much the, the West, right? So there's these regions where Christianity is like the religion. Why are people affiliating then? Partly it's self-interest, but that starts to ebb a little bit with the beginning of the Enlightenment. It becomes not as important for like your career to be a Christian, but it's still a habit. It's a tradition. It's a tribe. And so it keeps going and it keeps going. You have all these people affiliating. How many of those people were really, truly converted? Yeah. Like we can't measure that exactly, but my theory is that the number of actual people who were converted, it went up, but not that much. So now we've got like, you know, secularism, people can actually decide, do I want to believe or not? And we're seeing that affiliation go way down. What my father and I are arguing is that most of that affiliation that you're losing, those are the people that weren't really truly converted. So people are running around like this is the end of religion, you know, everybody's losing their religion. And it's like, no, what was happening under the surface was that the number of people who were truly converted was always small. But for a while, a long while, you had all these other reasons to affiliate with the church. And now those other reasons are going away. So and naturally, the, those people aren't, aren't, aren't coming, showing up anymore. And so it's not as though people are necessarily losing their religion as much as the ratio of people affiliating with the church as opposed to actually being converted is getting closer to one to one. Yeah, and this is going to sound really judgmental, and, and it's not. And, and, and let me explain why it's not. Oh, it's we like, like judgmental. Anytime that we can, you know, just feel that we're better than others because we put them down in a snide and kind of... Because uh, that's just, the point of religion, right? Yeah, <laughs> veiled critique, you know, just, uh, I'm down. Just, you know, keep going. <laughs> so one of the important things is that if there's no sacrifice, it's easy to affiliate, but it's actually hard to become truly converted. Mm. So during this period where everybody around you is Christian, it's really easy to be Christian without ever thinking about it. And so in a way you're kind of deprived of the opportunity to have more chances to become fully converted. Do you so, think that's where we're at right now? I kind of feel like maybe post-war up until the nineties or the early two thousands, I don't see how you could get elected president or senator without having some kind of general Christian affi- affiliation. Yeah, you still can't. Like, if you run as an atheist, I don't remember the exact poll numbers, but right now in the United States, running as an atheist is going to put you at a disadvantage. So I'm not saying, like, we've reversed. Nobody's feeding Christians to lions in the United States. There are parts of yeah. the world where Christians are genuinely persecuted, but not here. Yeah. So I'm not saying that, like, oh, no, Christians are persecuted, the tables have turned, but things have, they're going in that direction. I, I think as a society in North America as a whole, yes, I, I think you're right. I'm wondering in the microcosm of just Mormonism itself, do you feel that that we've kind of reached a, a, a sort of tipping point in which we're going back much deeper into the more truly converted? Uh, because I kind of feel like there was a post-war boom. I, I, I kind of feel like a lot of the missionaries that went out post-war, post-World War II, that is, um, we're spreading the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but being a predominantly American religion. I mean, in 1963, there was more members of the church in the state of Utah than the rest of the nation combined. OK, there was a big switch that happened after 64. And then we I was there in the 90s when the big switch happened and there was more members outside of U.S. borders than inside U.S. borders. So literally from 1963 to 1998, we're talking only you know less than 40 year period we went from being 
a niche club in a small flyover state to all of a sudden be in a worldwide religion. That is wild. That is expansive. And those missionaries that were going out, though they were spreading the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they were also kind of de facto spreading Americanism. And America was popular post-war because we defeated the Nazis. We would basically won the Cold War by 1989. And, you know, go America, hoorah, okay? Now that that's kind of ebbed down and the Americanism part of the equation is gone and the true religious core is there, you know, th there is a retraction. And I kind of feel like within the church as a whole, you know, there was a lot of explosive growth because, you know, let's face it, Western American suburbia was wealthy and having lots of kids and kind of on autopilot. I mean, we were sending kids to seminary to sleep and then go serve their missions in some country where they only had to basically recite pre uh, prepared um, d d discussions. And it kind of worked in a communal, hey, let's all be friends and love Jesus kind of way. But when the nitty gritty came and things got tough, you realized you had three generations of lazy learners. I mean, we're not just talking one, like three generations of lazy learners from the boomers well, I mean, all the way to the millennials. And, and, and those are the ones that are leaving. I mean, what you're describing is the exact same like arc that I just did for all of Christianity. So it's like the same thing for mm -hmm. all of Christianity. It took from like three, 400 AD until like it was, you know, the enlightenment. So in the 1700s, 1800s is when things started to turn down, like for the Latter-day Saints, we in America, especially we've done the same kind of arc. It's just really, really, really compressed. Mm -hmm. So instead of being like 1400 years, it's like 140 years. But yeah, no, I, I think the, the, the dynamic is the same and it's definitely accurate. We, we were coasting um, and it made affiliation easy. Um, and it made our, you know, it was easy to, to get a lot of new converts and you can look at our growth numbers. We're still growing much faster than most other Christian faiths, but not nearly where we were before. Mm -hmm. um, the easy days are, are gone. And I think that is largely a good thing. So Nathaniel, I have a question. Do you, because when I, when I hear this, my immediate thought is that we've had such institutionalized faith. I mean, this is the first time in which we've ever had churches that are worldwide, right? I mean, like the printing press kind of did change the game for religion and the religions that were able to, for example, paganism wasn't making it past the printing press because it, it frankly is not a correlated a system of belief. And yeah, yeah we, you know, we stomped him out. But the ones that remain. <laughs> that, that's also a good point. <laughs> take their festivals and convert them. Pa yeah. Paganism is not making it past the printing press. It's not correlated enough. Mm. Christianity is. And, and Mormonism is especially correlated. So a lot of people equate faith with institution just naturally. You know, I mean, if you grew up in the 60s and 70s, evangelicalism, you had the Billy Graham style of evangelicalism. You had the good stuff. You know, you had the like the really convicted, heartwarming. Now evangelicals, you just got a bunch of pastors that are you know hooking up with their 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 the girls in their youth clubs, all fighting over whether or not there's a biblical reason to watch the chosen or not. Right, you know? right. I mean, it's, it, evangelicalism's it, not to be rude, but kind of a joke now. However, with our church, I mean, people cannot separate the gospel from the institution of the church, and at least with the Gen Z people. My friends, the people I talk to, there seems to be uh, uh, way less people saying, well, rather, I'll, I'll phrase it this way. There seems to be less Gen Z people with the pessimism of Gen Xers and millennials saying, oh, I think Joseph Smith was a fraud. It's all fake. I don't hear that. I hear, I don't like the church, but I do believe in the gospel and I do believe in the teaching because that's what I hear quite a bit. So my, my question is like, is is having these independent Mormons who are not affiliated with the institution, where does that fit with uh, with this diagnosis? Do these people still count as the people of faith? Do we count them as inactives? Do we count them as ex-Mormons? Because they're kind of all three. I mean, I, I don't know how you want to count them, but what I'm hearing from what you're saying is, is this contradiction. And I just want to point out that that's not a new contradiction. Right. Joseph Smith was one of the most like freewheeling. Everybody gets their own testimony. Everybody gets their own religion. Very, very romantic, decentralized thinkers that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And he was like obsessed with like legalism and priesthood keys. <laughs> right. So from the very, very yeah. beginning, we've had in our tradition this weird contradiction between like hyper formalism, hierarchy, keys, legalism. Like, like that is as legalistic as you can get. 
And at the exact same time, in the exact same person, this kind of, yeah, you should go and pray like I did when I was 14 and maybe an angel will show up. Get your own personal revelation, you know, like radical agency, like free will. Like we've, we've had those two aspects in our religion since day one. So that conflict isn't anything new. Um, and it's always a struggle to mesh those. And yeah, I think for a while, we've probably leaned too much into correlation. And, and we, I'm talking about the members, not the leaders. Um, and we've coasted on that. And now you've got people saying, well, okay, I, what's the point of the institution? Well, they're going to have to figure it out because the institution does play a role. If you, you can't just set aside all that stuff about priesthood keys and hierarchy and all that stuff and just go your own way. You can't do that and still be inheriting the legacy of the restoration because the legacy of the restoration has both parts. And how do you get those two things to, to, to work together? There's tension. It's not easy. It's not trivial. I can't give you like the one answer, like here's how to make it work. Yeah. But I think it's one of those tensions that's productive. Yeah, Trying and- to wrestle with that and figure out how to make those two fit together. It's like individualism and collectivism. We have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling as individual people. But Zion is a communal project. How are you going to fit those two things together? Well, I don't know, but having a church that is like, hey, do your own thing, radical free agency, also we're highly, highly correlated – is going to help people like confront those problems that we do need to work through. Yeah, which I I think is a really awesome thing that you do in the book is help people understand like, hey, these difficulties are good for you. They help you understand yourself better and really, um, as long as you're actually doing something about it, they will help you to um, really understand more of who you are. And it feels like that's kind of what God wants from us. Is that's that's a lot of the same perspective. We're here for a reason. The reason is to learn and grow. Nobody learns and grows by just sitting around and doing nothing. Mm -hmm. Like it's kind of an irreverent analogy, but I'd say God is a little bit like a physical trainer, right? His job is to push you because it's in pushing you that you grow, which is the whole point. Yeah. And and I really like the thing Quaku brought up, like the people who are getting this independent feel, that's a good thing because they're helping move things forward where the people in the institution who are just like, if they were just well, the institution is this way, so this is how it's always going to be. They don't maybe have as much of the spirit guiding them in the right direction. I think either one of those leads to something bad. I feel like the um, Jacob's olive branch uh, allegory kind of has something to do with this, that the wild olive branches brought in help bring life to the entire tree. As long as we're all doing it from a faithful perspective, which again, the, the book talks about gratitude, appreciation and openness being hallmarks of faith, which I love the way you guys talk about faith in the book, because it's so much different than the way people sometimes perceive it. Like it's it's a response, not a proposition. I loved that line that you guys had in there because it's like you see these problems. How are you going to respond to it faithfully? Yeah. And I got to say a, a personal conversion of mine. I've, I've always thought about my faith from a very young age and tried to work these things out. And our acceptance of the dual nature of things was always what made me think that we we're the correct church. We're not all grace. We're not one of those hippie faiths that say, oh, as long as like at some point you recognize you're effed up and you know that you need Jesus, then it's all good. And then we're also not hyper obsessed with like the law of Moses. You know, we're not the Sanhedrin saying that your salvation will be determined by your adherence to these rules as the Apostle Paul called them. I think he called them what dead acts or uh, dead rituals or whatever. It was always the fact that we say, hey, no, 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 it, it, it's it's grace and works like and they're codependent on each other, just like scissors are codependent upon each one of the handles just like legs are codependent on each other for balance and walking there is a duality we, just like me and my wife are codependent wait a second yeah <laughs> yeah <it>. exactly <laughs> but but really like if you think about it we are an esoteric faith We're, this is a, this is a uh something that i love that Quaku brings to the channel is we're the only faith in christianity that still says oh yeah miracles uh Religious artifacts, uh, you know, like we're one step away from this theosophist society. You know what I'm saying? When it comes to our acceptance of like, yeah, basically, for lack of a better term, magic, real, awesome. OK, but at the same token, we have scriptures that literally say you will not have access to that magic. You know what I'm saying? You won't have access to that revelation unless you have, you know, uh, done all that you can do and you're and you're spiritually refining yourself and you're working for it. It's like we have to wrestle with the angel, but then we also have to believe that the angel can inspire us simultaneously. And and that duality to me is is the proof 
of of the true nature of the church because with either one it can't survive. So anyway, I, so I'm going to move I, on. I have one more question. Oh, hit it, for, hit it, and then I got my scientism on. question. So, I I have this prediction that uh, faith kind of changes based on the age. So right now we're 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 in the tech we're in the technical age, we're in the technical revolution. We're about to enter into the AI age. The dawn of the age of Aquarius. Um, I wasn't going there. With it. <laughs> um, to, okay, so to play Baphomet's advocate. Oh uh, God! Okay. <laughs> no, but but uh, how do we think faith is going to play in this next age? Because we, for for example, I don't I don't I don't know if the brethren saw TikTok coming. I don't know. I certain no one no one really did. No one realized the ag- the gravity of the, of social media and the way it would play in our everyday lives to now the level of we're getting rid of cash. Everything is going to be tech. Everything is going to be on cards. Like we are firmly headed into the technological revolution. So are we going to see another uh, awakening? Are we going to have another awakening of faith? Are, are, are we going to have a rebellion to the, the robots are we, you know, like what is going to be happening here? Because we saw Joseph Smith, we had the second great awakening with Joseph Smith. And then some people say that in the early uh, 20th century, we had the third great awakening with, you know, Guy Ballard and the Shasta and the, and the Blavatsky's and all that. Do you predict we're going to, we're going to have another boom and people are going to become religious again, or do you predict it's going to sort of and Wayne. like Moroni at the end of the Book of Mormon, where we're just overseeing the slaughter of our people. <laughs> because, I mean, it, oh, it really could go either way. Because the way you're saying it is that um, uh, the, the, the converted will become more and more converted. And, and those who are not converted will, they'll, they'll, they'll be just like the world. And that divide's going to be bigger. Um, however, I kind of I, I kind of have this hope that it's going to be like the hippies, whereas the kids raised by the hippies are like... Yeah, seeing dad naked smoking pot every morning in the kitchen just really made me want to be Catholic. Like, it just really, (laughs) I had enough of that. We had a nice religious boom after the hippies. You know, is there room for that interpretation? I mean, I think there's room for that interpretation. But if you're looking at the Book of Mormon, and and I'm I'm reading in my personal study right now, I'm in 3rd Nephi, what you're seeing is that the closer you get Oh, you're still active? (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's just okay. No, no just follow. because he wrote a book <laughs> quoting scientists just, yeah, doesn't just, mean he's out. He's of a the Gibbons. Church. I heard they're all Prognos now, but oh like you know, no, I'm just I'm totally, <laughs> totally just kidding. No, I'm totally just kidding. Keep going, dog. Keep going. The the closer you get to the arrival of Christ, the faster and the the wider those oscillations get. So right now, one of the big things that people are still talking about is, is wokeism, right? And and from my perspective, it looks like at least where I hang out, it's already peaked and it's starting to recede a little bit. But the important thing is that for somebody a little bit older than you, Quaker, like me, I was around for the whole political correctness thing in the 90s, which was like wokeism 1.0, yeah. right? Now we got wokeism 2.0. Like what's my prediction is that we're going to get wokeism 3.0. It's going to be worse. And it's probably going to, the gap between 1.0 and 2.0 is probably going to be longer than the gap between 2.0 and 3.0. So I think you're going to get swings back and forth. Cause I mean, again, just look at the book of Mormon and the, these people are going back and forth from like everybody believes to everybody. doesn't believe in the space of years. Now, I don't think that means that like every individual person is swinging that rapidly. I, I just don't think that's realistic. What I think it means is that the people that society pays attention to swing rapidly back and forth between a, a, a group who are who are faithful believers. And like when Nephi is not Nephi, son of Lehi, but Nephi, like son of Helaman, um, prays and is like, hey, there should be a famine. Um, so you guys stop killing each other with a sword. Um, and then it, that works. And the people are like, please, please, please let there be no more famine. He prays there's no more famine. Well, everybody joins Nephi's church because he just ended the famine. So he gets really popular. How many of those people, again, affiliation conversion, how many of those people were really converted versus how many were just affiliating to him because they saw his miracle? So everybody rushes over in that direction. It gets really popular to be a believer. A few years later, Satan's you know spreading lies again, is, is what the text says, and everybody kind of swings the other direction. And, and the closer you get to the arrival of Christ, the faster and the worse those oscillations get. We're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, latter days. Christ is coming again. The closer we get to that, the more you're going to see those oscillations. And I think society is going to start to fragment more and more and more. So when you try to do these predictions like what's going to happen, you can't make a prediction for like what's going to happen with society because there's so many tribes. 
And within these tribes, there's going to be so much movement back and back and forth. Um, and so if you don't have faith, and if especially if you don't have like the Book of Mormon as a frame of reference, it's just going to look absolutely insane. I mean, just look at the news. Look at every, everybody's freaking out about gas stoves. Where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, right? The and Democrats. Out of no, right. But like wh- whoever brought it up, like out of nowhere, gas stoves became like the thing. And uh-huh. by the time this airs, people will be like, what is he talking about? Because we moved yeah. on so fast. And if, if, if you don't pay attention to the Book of Mormon to kind of have that frame of reference, you're just going to be – you're not going to be able to explain anything. So, um, but f- oh, sorry. Finish I mean, that, your – That is true. La- last time we were in the studio, Kanye West was with – yelling about and now the largest rapper in the world was praising a guy who killed nine million not news anymore you know yeah yeah that's true um so here's i i don't want to keep you forever i know we got to end sometime soon here um you, brad you got a, a question or can i ask mine go 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 ask yours. mine. okay and then i got so i love i i have i this is a family gift that you have okay i've probably read five or six of your parents books and I loved it because I felt they would oftentimes articulate into words a general feeling I had had for a long time. And you got that. And I think you actually even did it better. Go tell your dad you did better than him, according to uh, Cardinalis on Midnight Morning. How could you tell you we're co authors? What'd you say? <laughs> How could you tell we're co authors? Well, because you one. told me before that you wrote the first draft and he had just edited it, right? It's a little more than that. It's a 50-50. That's what I told oh, okay. you. Okay, fine, Carden, fine. Carden went through fine. and highlighted the parts no. you, he thinks you wrote yeah. versus your dad. No, no, I highlighted the <laughs> parts I liked. And see, this actually proves I actually read it because I got all the highlights here, right? But anyway, um, what you said on the scientific hy- or the secularization hypothesis and how that has gone through our society, its ramifications thereof. I mean, it was a thing of beauty. I just had to stop highlighting or else I would have just gotten like the whole page. You know what I'm saying? And just had to like circle it. On scientism? So on, yeah, on on both the secularism hypothesis and on scientism. But you end the book here. I'm just going to skip all the way to the end saying the cultural headwinds, the biological headwinds and the psychological headwinds. Um, and the whole book is called Into the Headwinds, right? So just as fast as you could summarize, what are those cultural, biological, and physio- uh, psychological headwinds? And like, like, how do you overcome them in the modern day? Because after all, it, it, this is a book about faith, and we haven't even gotten to that technically that faith part and how to overcome it, right? So, so for you, what are those headwinds? How do we overcome them? How do we lean into them? <laughs> you picked the part my dad wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking with you. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> hit it. That, hit that, it. that whole section is his. I, I I did most of the rationalism and the scientism, and then you're 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 coming from part three. Part three is is ninety percent his. Well, well, if you can speak on the scientism, I thought that, you, that I would love to hear that as well. If you if you got time to hit the scientism part and then tell us how we uh, go into the headwinds, that'd be great too. Yeah, sure. So for the scientism thing, I, the, the key takeaway, the most important fact to realize here is that science is taking credit for a lot of stuff that it doesn't deserve credit for. Um, the word science was invented in 1830, and it, it was invented. We, I, I don't re- remember the name, the name of the guy off the top of my head, but there was a dude, and he invented it, and it was a marketing plan. Like He, he wanted to break off this part of natural philosophy and make it more credible. And one of the things science is kind of... And not scientists. Scientists are too busy actually proving stuff and doing real work. But the science boosters, who are not the same as the scientists, science TM. One of, yeah, yeah. One of the things they've done is re- is like they retconned the history of the industrial revolution, and they were like, "Look at all these things science got us." Now, when you have a, a group of people like with a banner saying we claim credit for these good things, what you have is a is a religious confrontation. So it was a deliberate attempt by the boosters of science, again, who are not the same as scientists, to kind of say in the modern era, all all the things that you're grateful for, they came from science. So we should have the the authority in society. Don't look at priests of religion. Look at priests of science. Going to the Uh, humanly, we are are gathered together in the robes of a false priesthood. If you reference, it's really cool. Um, And what they did specifically, or what I did in the book, is I just went back and I looked at the most famous inventions I could find from the Industrial Revolution, pretty much from Wikipedia. And I was like, which one of these came from science? And there's like one guy, Diesel is, is a guy's name, and he actually was like, here are some scientific theories. I'm going to apply these and I'm going to build an engine. That was like the one thing. Everything else that we care about from the Industrial Revolution was some dude tinkering in his garage. Some of those folks weren't literate. Some of them were salespeople. Mm-hmm. Some of them were um, actors. Like you just had all these people who were like, I'm going to try to make stuff work. 
why are you giving science credit for a bunch of people with no degrees working outside of, uh, of universities who invented stuff? So it, it it's a little bit of a fraud. It, 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 and, uh, go ahead. And, and I, I loved how you pointed out how they kind of bury that Isaac Newton was like a major alchemist. And he wasn't just a scientist who happened to be an alchemist. His uh-huh. key breakthrough about gravity came directly from the Emerald Tablet, which is one of the most revered alchemical works. Um, the specific line is as above, so below. And he took that idea and he was like, okay, so the force that's making an apple fall from a tree here on earth below is the same as the force that's keeping the moon up in the sky. And so it was this alchemical concept. And from that concept, we get Newton's laws of gravitation and motion. Mm -hmm. Um, And they bury that because they're trying to make the separation where you can choose either religion or science and you should choose science. We're the new priests. Um, And again, like Newton wasn't doing that. Newton's the scientist. Newton doesn't care. Newton was trying to figure out how things work. Scientists aren't out there like fighting for social authority. They're out there trying to discover the mysteries of the universe. I have no problem with scientists. I have no problem with science. I love them both. But you've got this group of people kind of around them who are who are building up these institutions and they want social capital. They want credibility. And so they're manufacturing. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's just incentives. Right. If you have a job, you want your job to seem as prestigious as possible. There's no secret cabal. There's no conspiracy theory. It's just people. Who That's get where there. you go wrong. And Quake, who's going to tell you all about it? Brad, just have to say no, I'm just kidding. Keep going. Keep going. I, I, Brad. I just wanted to say I, I loved the way that you outlined in there. Rationality is not the be all end all of thinking and thought and learning and progression and truth. It requires intuition. And that's what happened with Isaac Newton. That's what sh- should be happening with us. We need to be using rationality and our intuition in order to find truth. Rationality isn't enough to get you there. You need that intuition. You need that faith to be able to move us forward. Yeah, logical awesome. empiricism. I actually so, had written down as the title of this podcast, maybe that logical empiricism is not the only way to know things. But you've said so many other cooler one-liners right now that we'll just we'll just have to go with one of those. So, yeah, Kwaku. There, there's this quote. Um, it's a really it's a really good quote. It, it doesn't really have an author. It's one of those mysterious quotes. So it's Abraham Lincoln. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Bill Cosby said, uh, if you think what they did in the name of the old religions was bad, wait until you see what they do in the name of the new ones. And what Whoa. you were just talking about makes me think of that because as horrific as some of the things done and then by order of Christian priests, I fundamentally believe those will not hold a feather to what will be done in the name of our new science TM priests. D- d- emasculation. And I have a friend getting the surgery done. I mean, and I would just look at Canada and how many the people there are dying from euthanization. And this is what I'm talking about. That's not a bunch of scientists out there killing people, but it is the, the scientific establishment, the institutions that have the aura of like, we use data and numbers, probably not, but they pretend they do. We have the credibility. And so we're going to kind of tell you with our expertise, you know, which lives are worth living and which aren't. And, it's, well, and, and this could, is what, the, yeah. this is why the first vision is so beautiful you can apply the same thing to right now. These are priests and those are creeds. And and not to dog because on, on your academic friends because I know that you guys all have PhD in those three letters. After yeah, we don't else. want your friends over at Faith Matters <laughs> but, to get dunk on you in that next podcast. Okay, so. I, know, I don't have a PhD. I, I know your Discord <laughs> group yes. chat, someone's going to make fun of me yeah. and be like, Quake, who's crazy? <laughs> but there there is, a, like, I'm sorry, at some point we do need to recognize that Modern academia and its ties with corporate science is a new religion. And how they demand people fall in line is a religious tactic. How they uh, 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 punish people. they, they th- acad- Modern academia, and I would even say with the sprinkle of woke, with using science as their priesthood, they excommunicate you. At least in our churches, you have to be a member to be excommunicated. They and can excommunicate we make you, you just cookies from the after. public. So it is a new religion we're dealing with. These are new priests. You can call it different things, but the structure in the organization is the exact same. And uh, I think Jesus would call their priests and their creeds an abomination, the yeah. same way he said it was back then. Yeah. So um, anything you want to say before we wrap up, dude? 
like have we missed anything what, what, what or, or, where did we go wrong anywhere just what you got no, I, don't, I don't think we were wrong anywhere i am curious if quaku has read john mccorber's book um about wokeism as a religion i forget exactly what it's called but like that's not a new theory i think you're 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 hitting a little bit the wrong target when you when you aim string is straight at academia um, you but say not that. far off. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so you're an academia bee. That's what you are. Yeah, look, 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 the one thing I would I would wrap up with here that I, I want people to understand is that I, I like to, to do all this intellectual stuff. I like to write a book like this with my dad. I, I like to talk about theology. Um, I, I want to be absolutely sure that everybody knows where I'm coming from, which is that um, I have, I, I like to think. And so thinking is how I worship, right? Hmm. Um, it's not privileged. Nobody needs to read a book like this to get to the celestial kingdom. Nobody needs to have like a really intricate, ornate the uh, theology of their own to get to the celestial kingdom. Life is not a theology test. If you can sing, then you sing the praises of the Lord. If you can build, then you serve other people and you build houses. If you write and I write, then you write. Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing. And so I just I, I want I want to be really clear on that that I don't think there's anything special or privileged about approaching the gospel in an intellectual way. I won't apologize for it. Mm -hmm. Just like I don't think somebody who's a musician should apologize for making gospel inspired music. Do it. Use the gifts that you've got. And the audience that I'm looking for and that I'm hoping to reach are other people who approach the gospel in similar ways. Um, but what I what what really matters at the end of the day is praying, reading your scriptures, and going to church, serving your fellow men. Right. So even though I love to get into all this stuff and it, it is cool, it's not the meat. It's it's just it's just a way for some people to approach this stuff. But the thing that they should be approaching is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he's not going to be impressed with our theological papers. <laughs> he's not going to be like, dang, bro, like you use some big words. You're definitely going to be saved. <laughs> like, I, I, I just I just want to plant a flag on that, that I am aware of that. And I know that and like. This stuff matters to me because of who I am, not because it's actually more important. Why did I think you were British? Because my mom has a British accent. Yeah, there dude. Okay, I, I didn't know she had a British <laughs> accent until I audio booked uh, All Things New like three weeks ago. Dude, I thought Elizabeth Hurley was just whispering sweet nothings into my ear the whole drive from Beaver, Utah to Los Angeles, California. Man, she sounds like a fox. No, I thought you guys were all English. And so when you started, I expect you, oh, I'm Nathaniel Givens. I'm going to, I was like, oh. <laughs> that you're no, not. And I was like, well, I, he's American. I spoke in an English accent until I was five years old and went to public school. So I was this little kid in North Carolina growing up in a trailer park with, a, with an English accent. Uh, That's awesome. <laughs> that is so epic, and, dude. And Nathaniel, I want to say, uh, one thing that I've really appreciated <laughs> is um, the way that you think, I think, is a very good thing. And I think there are a lot of people in our audience who would really appreciate it. Um, I think a ton of them should just follow you on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? Just Nathaniel Givens. Yeah, because I know Cardinal freak out when he sees the Ukrainian flag um, in your bio. Yeah, but, um, I'm, I'm with you. Too. I'm pro, I'm pro <laughs> Ukraine. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think anybody really has a problem with that. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I love the things that you post on Twitter about your scripture studies. I think that that's actually a super good use of social media. And I just don't see that very often where people are using social media for good. So I want to plug that. That um, why, why, do people, yeah. why do people think you're like a hardcore progmo woke? Because they saw the Ukrainian flag. <laughs> uh, no, d d no the, do, it's do not people, people really think no, that? No, because the cry it, bullies it, try and co-opt everything. No, no well, sorry, I, 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 I didn't, didn't. People don't think I, that. J Jacob's buddies think that, but but the uh, the rest of us don't think that. <laughs> no, we, we're just kidding. We just totally, yeah, we were just totally joking with you, bro. So, um, but yeah, so I think people I'm trying should, to wrap it up. Damn it, I no, know. Just, <laughs> but um, people should follow you on Twitter for sure. And then the book again <laughs> is called Into the Headwinds, right? Yeah, you're doing my job. I'm sorry. You're doing my I, job. I stopped. I stopped. I'm done. <laughs> you know, I'm done. I was going to say, Nathaniel, how can people reach you? And he was going to cordially tell his Twitter handle and his Instagram and all that other stuff. But you did that part for me. You so now, taking too long. Yeah. Okay. So, so that the <laughs> name of the book is Into the Headwinds. Everybody, go buy it. He doesn't sponsor the channel. Uh, he doesn't get any kind of what? What's so big? Nathaniel, are you married? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, for some reason I thought you were single. I think it'd be cool to have a video of you and Steven Smoot fighting to the death for a woman. No. <laughs> I've, been, I've been chatting on mute, telling my children to be quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, that's, that's funny. I, that's, I didn't I see a ring of the hand. I was like, what if we had like Smoot? 
and Givens uh, just, fight uh, to the death. That'd be funny. You know? Okay. I, I could never fight Smoot. Yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. That's All right. So the book is Into the Headwinds. Go buy it. It's a it's super also on Audible. Yes, it's oh, on Audible. Yeah. It just came out a couple days ago. So I'm sorry. Nice. And it's only about a three hour listen. If I'm correct, right? A lot of yeah, it's a sh- short book. audio books are freaking like 14 hour listens. It's like, oh, geez, that's like two trips to Utah. So, okay, awesome. Guys, go check it out. It's Into the Headwinds. Read it. Uh, you will not regret it. It's the only book that we have recommended thus far. So, check it out. This is Midnight Mormons, Midnight Strike Through Mormons. We'll see you guys in the next program.